Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, whatever you're do doing, and welcome to another episode of Media Matters for Anfield Index. It's the international break, ladies and gents. It's nearly over. It's nearly time for Chelsea. It is time to remember, though, the Reds coming back top of the league. And here, hopefully enjoying some sort of a, a break or a bit of downtime, as normal with me is the renowned and the respected David Lynch. David, is that a, a fair statement? Has there been a bit of a downtime in this international period? Yeah, it's just nice. It's nice having the weekends free and a bit of time to yourself, a bit of time with the family as well. And so I, I do enjoy these. And like I, I, I just think when you when you come into them and you're top of the league and everything's going well and everybody's kind of in a good mood, it's it's nice. It's nice time to reflect. And, and yeah, it's a bit less intense than, you know, Tuesday press conference, Wednesday game, Friday press conference, Saturday, Sunday game. Um, that gets a little bit relentless. So it is, uh, you know, as much as people despise the international breaks, I actually do quite enjoy them, to be honest. So, um, yeah, I'm making the most of this. What we've, we've got one more after this, haven't we, before it just it's heads down then basically till the end of the season. So, yeah, I, I, w I will be enjoying them, even if others aren't really. I was going to say, you might find yourself in a minority there, but it is, that word is about to get relentless anytime soon. And ladies and gents, we'll talk to everything that's coming up, like the Chelsea game, like the season so far, a bit of wider football, but we'll also be talking what's been going around Liverpool off the field as well. And that probably seems the right place to start, David. And it is, I never thought I'd be saying this. I mean, this news sort of caught everyone on the hop. It just came from nowhere. It's not I'm going to start until next year, but Jurgen Klopp is set to be almost, I think his role is a global head of soccer type of thing for the Red Bull franchise. A very specific niche role he's not going to be on the touch fights so we're not going to have to witness that at all but very much very well paid as well I should say according to reports from the Red Bull group I mean there's been mixed reaction to this I think it's fair to say depending on where maybe where you're based where allegiances lie what have you made of this story what are your thoughts on this one I, th I think it's interesting obviously I, I, from a personal perspective I'm kind of ambivalent about it I, I, I don't quite buy into the idea that this is everything he stood against or anything like that I don't remember him ever coming out and well he, he wouldn't be in this job would he if he'd come out publicly and slammed Red Bull and, and all the things he was doing and you know I think he's been sort of taking stance sometimes against kind of the state owned clubs and the fact that they seemingly can bend the rules from time to time but uh, nothing really on the idea of a, a an energy drink corporation owning them, and and that's why he's ended up in the role. And I think from his perspective, it's a good fit. Um, obviously, that is his type of football that they play. It also keeps his hand in nicely a little bit because obviously he clearly wants that Germany role. We we saw the reports about the break clause there, and um, and so he's not completely out of football till that comes up. And I have absolutely no doubt that that will be the the route he takes eventually. Um, so, you know, maybe a, a good fit for him. Obviously, a great appointment for Red Bull because he really is, um, you know, an intelligent guy with so much to offer, not just in a managerial sense, but I think higher than that. And I think Mike Gordon's kind of alluded to that in the past as well. This is a guy who could could easily be CEO of a company and, and, and you know, work in the sort of back office stuff. So, um, yeah, I, I think a really good fit for him. I think, I think the one thing I'm kind of find interesting is that he was, you know, adamant when he left Liverpool, look, I'll be... I'll have at least a year off and then see what happens. And maybe he just meant management. And and obviously this will be less intense and less stressful than management. So we, we've got to factor that in. Uh, but I really did think he was going to have a year off and, and really kind of just enjoy his spare time and uh, completely recharge the batteries. But I guess, you know, these really driven people, they get bored quite easily. Maybe his, his wife's got sick of him and wanted to boot him out of the house um, because he's, yeah, he, he's getting bored as well. So... And, you know, maybe it's one of those. But I, yeah, that that was the only aspect that kind of surprised me a little bit is that I, I thought he would find it easier to kind of relax and, and take that entire year off before even coming back to something like this. But obviously, he's back sooner than that. So, um, you know, I, whether that gives you a little hint that there was more to his departure from Liverpool than we, we sort of heard, then, you know, I'm just kind of throwing that out there as a, a little grenade, but just kind of interesting, I thought. Yeah, it does seem very specific. We're not going to have to see him on the touchline, I suppose. That that would be the one thing that would be hurtful, I think, to a lot of Liverpool fans in a way. I mean, whatever the reports, and I think you're right, I'm kind of ambivalent. It might be that there's a there's a different perception or feeling, it's right to say, in Germany than it probably is in the yeah. UK. But this this doesn't change anything that Liverpool fans feel about Jurgen Klopp, isn't it? In fact, there's probably a bit of like fair play. If this is what you want, crack on, Jurgen. Yeah, no, I... 
because, like I say, he never really sort of came out and slammed the Red Bull model or said anything like that. I mean, he was quite open about his political views on other aspects and and, and was really clear on that. So this idea that he was a, you know, a, a nailed on ardent socialist who has betrayed his beliefs by taking this job, I, I don't really buy into that because I always sort of, from my personal understanding and sort of, you know, being around Jürgen a, a lot, sort of felt he was more kind of a, a liberal, really, than a than a you know a, a full on socialist. And so, you know, maybe we personally don't align on those kind of views, but you know, never held it against him. But it's uh, yeah, so I, I don't feel like it's a betrayal. I, I get why Dortmund fans absolutely do. Yeah. I think it's the kind of antithesis of what they want to stand for and what they want to be. Um, and obviously he's such a big hero there, so I, I get that. But from from Liverpool fans' perspective, I, I don't think it really takes the shine off at all because, as I say, he never really cut, sort of nailed his colours to the mast on that one. And um, it's not like he's he's joining Man City or City Football Group or anything like that. So, yeah, yeah I, I don't think it affects his, uh, his standing amongst Liverpool supporters at all. And I'm kind of surprised that, that some tried to angle it as if as if that yeah. were the case, really. I, I, think, I think Dortmund supporters have got a lot more reason to be upset about this one. Yeah, makes sense. Changes absolutely nothing for us at all. Yeah, it still works as a legend. So, yeah, we'll see how he gets on in that role. And a couple of articles I know you, you put out on your sub stack as well. So just wanted to sort of press, because is it, and I suppose leading into this, because it is the international break, do you get a chance to do more, I suppose you call them, research analytical pieces, really spend some time on things rather than like, say, the quick Tuesday, Saturday match report turnaround? Yeah, that it, do, it does give you more time. I, I also think, it, to be fair, it, it's more the case that these are kind of good times to put those things out. The, 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 the little bit of a break and a bit of a breather to to sort of reflect on what you've seen. Whereas, if you've got a match Wednesday, you've got a match Saturday. There's there's not a lot of space to, you know, pop in something that isn't match related or or, or an injury related or something that has happened that week. So. Uh, the good opportunity to do that so you know a lot of the legwork for, for these pieces that have come out this week is done way before that uh, but yeah it, it's nice to be able to that's another upside of the international breaks that you get to do the the kind of bigger picture stuff and, and really look where Liverpool are up to so I do do enjoy those and thankfully been quite well, well received as well yeah definitely and this is the one or a couple I want to ask you on the Ryan Gravenberg one first of all because naturally been the I suppose you call them the breakout star maybe the unexpected star a little bit of the season so far so I know that was an in-depth piece and that had almost his old coaches former players what well, I suppose was that enjoyable to almost do that research do a bit of Ryan Gravenberg's history how he's developed through time recently yeah because I, I just think it's always interesting to find out more about the character behind the player you know you don't always see loads of that when you, you're just watching the 90 minutes or the odd little clips we get from training Ryan Gravenberg's not someone who stops ever in the mix zone in my experience so we don't really get a lot of face-to-face -face time with him so uh, yeah it was nice to hear that and it, uh, it was interesting because I did think one of the, you always get kind of a big theme that comes out of these from everyone you speak to I mean I did one of Sobers Lie a while ago and everyone was kind of just like the self-confidence this kid has got is off the charts you know and that was and, and then you, you do think or you do actually see that on the pitch and with Gravenberg one of the themes that kind of came out was just how important his family have been in terms of just supportive and um, pushing him but in the right way not being pushy but but being really you know if you want it this is how we do it um, and, and one of his dad's old friends sort of telling me that uh, his dad played in exactly the same way, you know, sort of dodging challenges, and, and you find that I find that interesting that you can inherit a style of football from your your father. That's a, an interesting one, but yeah, it was it was really good to sort of get background on him and, and learn more about him um, and his journey and, and and the little bumps in the road he's had. So yeah, really enjoyed putting that one together. So there you go, kids. If you thought you could practice that body swerve, I'm afraid it's genetic. Simple as that, isn't it? I, to be honest, it's, it's great to hear that as well because I can just blame my dad now that I didn't make it pro. Yeah, I'm happy if I can stay on my two feet. So there you go. Yeah, it's different <laughs> that way. And the other article I really wanted to, to ask you about because it's naturally since, since last season almost, and we've talked about this at length, the injury crisis last season was horrendous and we're having players injured and re-injured, it's important to say. I know that was sort of a, a theme that came out. Very much this one intrigued me because I know you wrote about that Liverpool, and if I'm phrasing this right, have almost looked at the medical department holistically and then said, now nah, we need to split this almost match day instant and long-term recovery as well. It's a very big change in the structure. Was it sort of interesting to sort of research that and sort of tap into what Liverpool's plans are to try and change what happened last season 
Yeah, it, and to be honest, it, you kind of just see the odd appointment or whatever. And I, I actually kind of thought a lot of this is, you know, surface level bit of tweaking. Maybe they'll do something. But it, it kind of when I did a, a little bit of background into it, there's actually been quite big changes in terms of, you know, several people being promoted, changed their roles completely. Obviously, Jonathan Power now yeah. overseeing that whole department, which is a massive step up from from just being the, the team doctor prior to that. He really is in charge of kind of everything now um, and, and all the changes that have happened there. Uh, behind the scenes and then obviously as you say a bit of splitting in how they do physio which I think a lot of other clubs have tried and um, so Liverpool going down that route as well and I think the big takeaway for me from it was kind of that it's interesting that Liverpool clearly think there's a problem there that they thought that it just isn't good enough to be having as many injuries and I mean we've spoken so many times about the fact that you know people say oh the squad's not big enough or whatever the, the squad should be big enough that Liverpool cannot continue to get injuries at the rate that they have in previous years and in the past few years particularly um, that it's just not right and, and something had to change whether that was and part of that comes from the manager the style of play which is is a change that's coming in um, preparation and how they do that which obviously Ruben Peters will bring with it but then everything else as well they had a look at that and thought you know we, we have to have fewer injuries and I haven't got the statistics to hand and of course people can subscribe if they want to read it uh, but, you know, the early signs are pretty promising as well that these changes are sort of working. So, you know, touch wood that continues, but it's uh, it's something that I felt really, you know, amongst everything else that, that that needed to change at Liverpool this summer, because you know, that was kind of forced on them by Jürgen leaving. Yeah. I think the medical department was the change that Michael Edwards needed to make and, and, and to get better results there. And yeah, if they can continue in that way, I genuinely do believe that it's worth a few points in the Premier League table at the end of the season. So, yeah, hopefully it can continue in that way. And these these changes that they made uh, proved to be positive. No doubt. I mean, yeah, you think back to last season, that Luton game as well, where we went 1-0 down, as people said, we were missing 10 first-teamers that night. And even this season, it's only been a couple of ones tended to be Harvey Elliott, the long-term injury. I suppose in terms of a success, we have got to wait to navigate through this sort of busy period and see if we can keep it. But that's the measure, isn't it? Just how many players we can keep fit and available. Yeah, and at the end of the day, you are still going to get injuries. I mean, an impact injury like Harvey Elliott's, it can just happen at any time in, in training or whatever. There's not really an awful lot you can kind of do about those ones. Um, Alisson, you know, has got one now and, and probably not looking at seeing him now till, till you know, later next month. So that's a, another blow. That, but still... Still, I think there's been an uptick in terms of, you know, you look at Canate, you look at Jota, and as I say, statistically, it's looking pretty bright so far as well in terms of availability. So, yeah, you, you just have to keep that going because I just think the injury crisis for me was the definitive um, hail, really, of, of last season in terms of, you know, I, I know actually they did unbelievably well to get through the actual crisis itself, but by the time those players came back, the ones who'd been playing all the games for them were absolutely knackered. Uh, and then the ones who were coming back had zero rhythm, so they, they weren't playing well at all when they came back. So, um, you know, and that, and that for me was was one of the big differences between Liverpool and, and City and Arsenal, who had far fewer time loss injuries last season as well. So, um, yeah, it's it's just an area where you can clearly make gains, and I, I really do hope uh, Liverpool can can manage that this season because I think it can make a, a massive difference. And just while, before we finish talking about the. Uh, the Substack stuff. If I've got a new website address for it now, so it's davidlynchlfc.co.uk. So much easier to find if, if people want to go there and subscribe. No doubt. Well worth a subscribe. Well worth a read, ladies and gents. And Arna Slot said, give it two weeks before you ask in the last press conference. So we haven't got Arna Slot, but we've got you. So naturally, <laughs> the contract chat is the big one. It's, it's a strange one because... For me, a couple of weeks ago, there was a big thing Liverpool made and Tread made, like, I'm not going to discuss my contract in public. But we've probably never heard so much about Trent talking about his future, his aims, his mentality, as we have almost in recent weeks. And that combined with the reports coming out that Liverpool are now discussing it with the three players. Even yesterday, you've got Graham Souness in his mail column saying he only fancies really Van Dijk, one out of three. I mean... Trent has probably been more vocal in these last few weeks than we've really heard the before about his future, how he sees things. What are you making of everything he's saying? Because even he was talking about speaking about with Eze, wasn't he, on the coach and go in and trophies and that part. Yeah, I, I just think with Trent that everything he says is going to get dragged back to the contract though, isn't it? I, I don't think it's necessarily... I mean, he does get put up for these ITV interviews where seemingly... Uh, he just gets absolutely put through the ringer for some reason and, and quizzed like he's uh, he's on charges or something. I, I find that utterly bizarre, by the way. 
Um, you know, I still remember that ITV interview with him where it was kind of basically um, five minutes of him being asked, are you terrible at defending? And, I, you know, I know sometimes supporters can get a little bit too sort of touchy about that stuff, but I genuinely did think from a journalistic perspective that one was bizarre. And there were some kind of odd questions in this one, to be honest. But anyway, it's just kind of the, the way he's viewed through an England prism, I guess. But, um, you know, away from that, I think, like I say, I think all his answers are going to kind of be viewed through that that sort of aspect of, of where he's up to with his contract. I, I don't think he's kind of coming out intentionally to talk about it loads. I think the, the one when he stopped in the mix zone, definitely that was intentional. That was a, a, an attempt to kind of put out there where he's up to and what's happening kind of lay out publicly what he wants from Liverpool, I guess. Um, but, you know, th- this, this there shouldn't be this panic every time he speaks or does an interview that's um, contractual for, for television or whatever. It's, uh, you know, we can't always pull it back to the contract. He's not going out of his way to speak to ICV or whatever. So uh, I wouldn't be, you know, too concerned about that one. And I, I know people are. And I just think with Trent, the situation is always the, the same as it was. I think people can guess and, and think what they think about what's happening or where it's up to. But, Ultimately, Liverpool are desperate to keep him. I don't think there's been any sign from Trent's side that he definitely wants to go. And um, I think Liverpool want to, uh, you know, well, I know for a fact Liverpool want to reward him for what he is and what he will be over the next few years with a with a bumper contract. Uh, they're absolutely desperate to tie him down more than any of the three. So um, if that desperation is there on their on their side, he's happy to to kind of stay and isn't pushing for a Real Madrid move as things stand. Uh, then you know you've got to think that it's going to get resolved and and the whole world that will be that that will happen before January. So um, I just, you know, it's just not worth kind of worrying about at the end of the day. It's going to go the way it goes. And I, I still think there's, you know, like I say, real keenness on Liverpool's side to, to get this sorted out. So, you know, my, I still, you know, work in the expectation that it will get done. Um, and we'll just see how that kind of plays out. It will be interesting to see. I mean, naturally people are starting to sort of look at things and we, we do tick down. It's still a wait to January. Don't get me wrong, but people looking at it. Do you think it's just we're just gonna have to wait till we hear something? It'll just break all of a sudden. It won't build at all. It always does, doesn't it? At the end of the day, you know. Well, I know. I'll, t- I'll tell you now what'll happen with this one. Joycey will tweet when it's done, um, and then we'll we'll all kind of pile in behind that, um, and it will. It'll just come out of the blue like they always do, like Salah's did yeah. a few years ago. Um, you know when it like Canates did the other day, Quanta, and they just kind of come out of the blue. So it's it's not really you know. Reading the signs is is almost pointless, really, and uh, yeah. you know as much, it's kind of one of those in terms of what he wants to do. You, you can just kind of see the appeal of both sides in terms of you know going to Real Madrid and, and playing there with Jude Bellingham and great weather, uh, unbelievable experience, but also you know the, the the pull of Liverpool and the fact that Liverpool kind of seem to be on the right track to to well you know still been a really strong side in recent years, but trying to work the way toward back towards being um, the best of all the teams, and you know. Things kind of looking positive there. You would get an absolutely humongous wage bump. And also, I think there is an argument you could make as well that if you went to Real Madrid, he'd just be kind of one of many, wouldn't he? I know there's almost an element of guaranteed trophies if you go there, but I kind of think, well, you know, then you aren't really part of it, are you? You're just kind of, you're just a cog in the machine that wins trophies and that is happening coincidentally while you're there, but it could be just some other right back as well. So, yeah, I think there's real reasons to to think he would tie himself down to Liverpool. And I always go back to the quote he said about wanting to be Liverpool captain, which he hasn't done yet. So, you know, I, 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 I'm I still sort of lean towards optimism on this one. I just think there's no there's no point really. I, the, the, the moment for panic for me would be if you get into January and it's not sorted. So still a, still a while away from that yet. So, you know, kind of hang in there. And um, yeah, like I say, still I, I'm still optimistic. And we all await Friday's press conferences when Arnest Lot tells us absolutely nothing about it. You never know. He was promising big things. So, uh, yeah, we'll we'll see. Yeah, and we'll see on that one, definitely. And I suppose the other two, it, it's worth mentioning. Now, I'm going to be upfront about this. I know you like them and you enjoy the break. I despise internationals. I just worry about players getting injured and stuff like that. So I'll be upfront about this. But we actually had a bit of good news, didn't we? Because... Two players, man, and two, say, older players, but key players as well. It's never a bad sort of week when Van Dijk and Salah get a rest, is it? Yeah, really, really good news to Liverpool. That I mean, you know, great from the Egyptian FA to just say, don't come and play on this pitch. I mean, that's, you know, quite, I think sometimes FAs and uh, and clubs can kind of butt heads on these things. So the fact that they've worked together on that one and, and the FA have, have given up some ground on it is, is absolutely fabulous news for Liverpool, really. So that is really, really good. You want to look after Salah as much as possible and 
yeah, same with Van Dijk. I mean, he did come out after the game, didn't he, and suggested he was going to stick around. And clearly someone's put a phone call in and said, what are you talking about? No way, come home. Um, so again, great, great that he's doing that, getting a little bit of rest in and she'll be fully fit and, and, and firing for Chelsea. So yeah, really, really good news to Liverpool. And, uh, you know, they, they do, and I know this was a feature when Michael Edwards was there last time, is really trying to build good relations with, with international FAs. Um, uh, that was really was a feature that I knew about back then. Um, so clearly kind of they're, they're working towards that again and, uh, and making sure that they work together and it's a, it's a good relationship. So I think, you know, you can only get situations like this unfold and if you do have a good relationship. And so, yeah, looking for Liverpool, they do and, and both players are coming back. Yeah, definitely. And Trent looks like he's fine. Trent Alexander-Arnold, the England left back. I can't believe I'm saying yeah. that. In all honesty, but yeah, he's coming back. There is a few tonight. We've still got some touch wood. I mean, it's strange to say Monday night's big for us in the sense of Canate, Zabozlai, Gravenberg and Gakpo are still going to get through today. So fingers crossed for that. Probably the, the biggest worry, if you look at it on the horizon, being honest, David, is McAllister. I mean, he did play against Venezuela for Argentina. The suggestion that he is now back, and obviously on all the Argentina social media clips, he's back training. They only drew against Venezuela, so you just get the worry he's going to get thrown straight back into this. And they are the latest to play as in Wednesday, 1.30 in the morning, which isn't the big gap. And, oh yeah, there's just 15,000 miles to travel to travel back. This is the one where we are like, just fingers crossed on this, aren't we? Yeah, I mean, it's good at least that he's sort of missed a bit of training. He's, he's um, you know, he's not been playing. So, you know, at least, you know, you think if he, he could, you know, if the deal was there, he, he goes away, he has a bit of rest, he plays one game. You kind of take that. He's only probably had a couple of training sessions bouncing in, so it's it's not too bad. Um, yeah, and I mean, annoying about the South Americans, they've got to go that far, but what can you kind of do about it? Um, but yeah, that you, you just hope he comes through. And he seems to get, in every Liverpool game he plays, seems to get hit with a bad tackle. So, you know, yeah. I'm sure it's the same for Argentina as well, although I don't frequently watch them. Um, so yeah, you just hope he avoids anything like that and he comes through okay. And, and unfortunately, of course, obviously with it being Wednesday, uh, so so kind of late uh, in the mm-hmm. day that you know he's still got till Sunday. So I, I'd still expect I'm I'm right in saying that yeah Chelsea on yeah, Sunday. Sunday yeah, yeah. I've totally switched off at this point in uh, when the international breaks come around. But yeah, it's Sunday, and um, so that's a, a little bit of extra rest for him as well. So again, you would expect that he will be fully ready. It's not like he's coming back to do the Saturday twelve thirty where um, mm-hmm. it looked like he'd had his boots on the wrong feet that time when he did that once. So um, yeah, he, he he should you know fingers crossed to come soon the game okay and then if he does that then uh, he should be back and yeah ready for the Chelsea game which is the the big one from our perspective yeah absolutely fingers crossed Touchwood, it's not been too bad an international break so far and I suppose going well past returning bit of a surprise segment for this ladies and gents January and I know we're only in mid-October but it will be Liverpool we always say or we're always hearing that Michael Edwards plans, I think, three windows ahead, we're told. So, you know, I'm sure January will be in the midst of contracts and many other things. I mean, if you look at January and what you're seeing so far, David, in all honesty, which players do you think, because there's bound to be a few, because he doesn't seem to like rotating much, honestly. We've got to be honest about that. That is what the, you know, the data tells us. Which players do you think might just be having a quiet word, shall we say, with their agents at this time? There might be a few. I mean, who, who who would you say out of interest? So if Tyler Morton is not oh, having no. he's insane. But uh, yeah, yeah, no, fair enough. Absolutely on Tyler. I mean, I, I would expect him to get a move in January. I mean, it's quite clear he's got no kind of future in the in the first team here. He's a, a really good player, by the way, and I think there'll be a lot of interest in him. And um, so, I, yeah, that absolutely. I think in in January, I, I would expect him to go. Um, it's kind of a missed opportunity for him over the summer, not not getting gone then, but. Uh, yeah, I, I think it, you know Liverpool will be open to a sale. Absolutely, the player will be open to going. All the ingredients are there, pl- plus the interest from elsewhere, which there absolutely yeah. will be as well. So, uh, yeah, would would expect that to get done. And I think the the other one is kind of event endo. Is it? Are we kind of thinking? Yeah, and I, I, again, I, I don't know on that one really. I, you know, it was always my understanding over the summer that yes, Liverpool would have been open to selling him, but the, the player wanted to stay, he wanted to fight, he wanted to try and keep his place or, or try and, um, you know, at least do this season and see where he got up to. And I, I see those quotes from him and, and I don't yes. sense that there's been any change in the way he sees things. Obviously, 
been a really quiet start to the season for him. Um, you know, hasn't played very much, but he obviously thinks that there are going to be games, there are going to be injuries, which he's probably right. Um, you know, even if it, Liverpool's injury record improves, I'm sure they will get one in, in midfield at some point. Um, so, you know, th- there's opportunities for him. And of course, Liverpool's still in the League Cup as well. So the guaranteed game for him there, I, I imagine, because um, I- I- I'd like to see them keep rotating there, to be honest. So, um, yeah, I- for me, I-, I wonder whether he's just going to want to stick around till the end of the season at least and-, and see where he's up to there. Because, you know, if he's publicly saying that, and it was always my understanding over the summer as well that he wanted to stay, then I, I just sense he's going to, we'll be seeing him un- uh, until May at least, and then that will be the opportunity for him to kind of assess and, and think, okay, maybe now's the, the time to move on. So, yeah, he doesn't seem to be perturbed by the, the lack of, of game time so far. Yeah, we've never we've never been a club that bombs players out for want of a better expression so we'll be interested to see what develops the only other one I, I just wondered at just because of a sheer lack of minutes and sometimes you've got to be honest not even in the match day squad but more recently Joe Gomez do you think he could be looking in January yeah I think I think the big one there for Liverpool is basically if you know what what's the interest like and what is the sort of fee that's being offered up I mean the, you know I think there's every chance that you could go this window or the next well the coming window or the next one uh, well, certainly. I, I, in fact, I'd be kind of surprised if he's here after next summer. Um, but it's it's all about, you know, is the right club out there, the one that's willing to pay enough, the one that he wants to move to. Um, there's just a lot of moving parts there that you can't guarantee. But I don't, I don't think if a, a decent offer came in, there's no way Liverpool would shut that down. He just hasn't seen the pitch enough um, to justify saying, oh, well, we need you around. And it's not like uh, Jurgen was kind of forced to do that a few times with players on the basis that they kept getting injuries and, and there were problems there. Uh, whereas Liverpool so far are looking pretty healthy. So um, if that continues, then yeah, there'd be no reason for Liverpool to stand in the way. But the the the, the massive factor there is, is there a club like Newcastle that's willing to come in and pay X amount? Yeah. And we just, we just don't know if that's going to be likely because, you know, January is typically less busy. Clubs don't do as much business there. And um, so it, it's just whether that interest is there and, and, and firmed up really. But yeah, I, I absolutely don't think that, that Liverpool would stand in his, way, in his way if the right offer came in. Yeah, he'll, he'll probably be the third one to watch in. I suppose on the other side, incoming wise, we're often told Liverpool struggle to find players of the quality. So you think they might want to renew the three that are good enough to stay there and be stars at the meantime. But January, do you think we would will be looking or targeting any particular positions naturally everyone's desperate for you to say the number six now aren't they yeah i just think it's the obvious place where liverpool could use strengthening it's something i kind of plan on writing about this week actually is that ultimately you know i, I think the manager's shown who he's got faith in in that area and who he's not yeah. obviously the the short of harvey elliott who i think would have played a lot of minutes as well but i think in that sort of central midfield too it's you know, there's three of them at the moment. Is that enough to get you through? Do you need another one who can can help come in and, and rotate and, um, you know, take a bit of the the workload away from some of these players? What happens if you get Gravenberg or McAllister injured? It's it's looking a bit sticky at that point. So, uh, I, I really think they could do with with strengthening there. At the end of the day, Liverpool showed in the summer they thought that too. Um, so if that's why why would that have changed between now and January? I think they they, they knew that Gravenberg could play a lot of minutes. I don't think he's completely moved the dial so that they're like, well, well midfield sorted now. Uh, they, they still probably feel that they need someone else in there. So, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't rule that out at all. Um, it's just, yeah, always the, 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 the factor of is the right player available? Is that Zubamendi? Is that someone else? Um, you know, they've had a little more time to find alternatives now, by the way, which could be a factor. Yeah. Uh, but again, it's all about are the alternatives of which there will be a very, very narrow or, or a small pool are they available in the January window and you know sometimes players are not you can say about putting money in front but clubs will say no we don't want to lose until the end of the season do this one in the summer so um, that that's the only thing that would cast out on it but in terms of what Liverpool want I'd be surprised if they moved away from once in a central midfielder I suppose the, the part of that and people will wonder and because obviously it started so well we are top of the league there's so much to like about the underlying numbers as well do you feel they do need one more in there if this season's going to be successful? As in, they, they have numbers, but that's not the same thing as honest lot liking players, is it, at the same time? 
I think they could get away with it. I think, you know, if Endo's going to pick up all the League Cup minutes and, and you can keep Harvey Elliott fit to, to rotate with Sobers lie and then you've got Curtis, Gravenberg and, and um, McAllister as those three. If you get lucky with injuries, which it will be the first time Liverpool would ever be able to say that in about 10 years, um, then, you know, absolutely you could get through. And I don't think the, the success of the season hinges on getting someone in, but it would probably make, if it was a good sign and you got him which by the way there's always that risk that is terrible and it doesn't yeah. work out you know we're, we're working on the basis that Liverpool are generally pretty good at this but if it was the right sign and it absolutely could give you a beat boost and kick them on and um, just add you know just answer some of the questions that are maybe there about depth in a really important position so yeah. uh, I, I would love to see it absolutely but um I, I, I you know I'm reluctant to maybe say that the the success of the season kind of hinges on it because I, I still do actually think they could they could get away with it, but it's it's very reliant on not kind of getting injuries there to to any you know I think Gravenberg and McAllister if, if either of those got an injury Liverpool would be in quite a bit of trouble and, and that's not saying that Curtis can't play that role but he does it he does it in a different way and then all of a sudden you're down to two for two spots and that is a lot of work to get through so um, yeah I I just think it would be a lot easier to. To get another one in, and uh, but it's it's all about availability. Yeah, even just another a good body that could rotate would be so valuable. We'll have to see what comes in. I mean, speaking of transfers, we're playing the team on Sunday that loves the transfer in their droves as well, don't they? I mean, it's been such an interesting team to watch, and probably still will be throughout the course of this season. And you know, they'll get resounding quite rightly booed when they visit Anfield on Sunday, but. What have you made of Chelsea and Maresca, especially the way they've gone about everything so far? Yeah, they, they seem to be getting there a little bit, don't they? Which is, um, I, I kind of didn't expect, uh, you know, the, the chaotic transfer business that they've done and the way they've been running the club so far is uh, shambolic. And I, I do think as, as well, there's a real chance of some sanctions coming at them further down the line. There's just no way they can sort of right that, I don't think, financially. So um, I, I do think PSR-wise, something's coming for them. But uh, in terms of the team, it sounds, sort of seems like he's he's build, building an actual team, and and uh, you know I've said before I think they've got the probably the best player in the Premier League at the moment in Cole Palmer. He's he's absolutely flying. He's a, a phenomenal footballer. I quite enjoy watching him. Actually, it's a shame shame he plays for Chelsea to be honest. But uh, but yeah, they they do look a bit more of a team. I think there's still flaws there that makes them a kind of top four challenger rather than anywhere near the title. I wouldn't expect that at all. I think there's. There are some flaws there, but the, you know a lot more dangerous than you would have said coming into this maybe last season. And um, they, they do look like they can do they can hurt you a bit more. They're a bit more stable and a bit more solid. So um, yeah, it, it's an interesting challenge for Liverpool and and, and one that I think probably got to take a bit more seriously than maybe have from from Chelsea in the last couple of years. It's uh, it's going to be quite tricky, I think. Yeah, Anfield will definitely be up for it on Sunday, and it's interesting can you say because the. They've done certain stuff well. I mean, they've scored a raft of goals in certain games as well. You look at them and sometimes you think, Christ, that is kamikaze style at times, the way they play out for the back. Do you think that is something amongst other things you might target or look at come Sunday? Yeah, but I think anyone who tries to build up in the way that Chelsea do, you know, slotted, likes pressing, he likes winning the ball high up the pitch. So it's absolutely going to be kind of one of the, the focuses really for Liverpool this is to try and cut that off. And I think one thing that... that could possibly hurt Chelsea. They are defensively a little bit questionable and Liverpool have got goal scorers. So, um, you know, it, it could be one of those where it's a big game, but if Liverpool get a couple in quick succession, they could absolutely batter Chelsea, you know, as good as they are or the, the improvement that we've seen from them. So, um, I still think it's one that Liverpool are massive favourites for. They look a lot more of a solid, insane team in comparison to Chelsea. But it's, uh, like I say, you know, if Liverpool have an off day, Chelsea have got players who can really hurt them. So, um, you know, it's not one that can take lightly at all. Yeah, will be interesting. And Kukurea are out as well, Fafana are out. So, yeah, maybe a Shumbuish Hill, but a small wee knock for Cole Palmer won't hurt or yeah. we'll see Sunday. And we are 10 games in, so probably a bit of a good chance to do with the break being on the season so far and what you've seen as the best, what you've seen as sort of maybe things to think about as well going forward. So in terms of the 10 games that you've seen so far, what's actually been the best performance for you, would you say, that you've witnessed so far? It's a bit of a weird one, this, because I do think, you know, through all the performances, really, they've been kind of small, questionable elements. I'm not being overly negative there. I just think, um, you know, it's just been a kind of a feature of the season so far because it's a new manager. 
of just things being a little bit up and down even during matches. So, I mean, you know, United away was absolutely phenomenal, but obviously yeah. 3-0 Liverpool take the fuss off the gas and, and United have a good few chances there that could, you know, and also, you know, your view on that is coloured by the fact that United are now, is quite clear, absolutely dreadful. So, you know, I do think that's, you know, something to kind of think about. But for me, and again, this will seem bizarre, I thought the, the, the win at Crystal Palace last time out, the first 60 minutes of that, is as good as we've seen Liverpool play under Arna Slot. I think it was eight shots to one. Um, they were just so dominant, using the ball in the right way, creating chances, uh, looked really protected, looked like they, they, were, they were difficult to score against. Um, there was just a just an awful lot to kind of like about it, really. And I just think that, that for me, weirdly, was, was kind of one of the most satisfying, uh, you know, performances that they put in so far. So I... I kind of really like that, and I know I know that's not the entire ninety minutes, but it, I, that that for me showed me what you want this team to be eventually under slot, and and um, yeah, I just I, I just thought that 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 that's as convincing as Liverpool have been so far, and the hope is that it's coming soon that we will see that over ninety minutes. Hopefully, that comes at Arsenal or against Chelsea or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that that for me was the most encouraging and, and, and the best the team has played so far. I would have to say. Yeah, and maybe in a, in a strange way, just the nature and the style, we've not needed to go sort of pedal to the metal yet for 90 minutes, which actually, you say we'll be on the legs, that might be beneficial long-term as well, so we'll see. Best goal so far, there's a few contenders for this one. Yeah, weirdly one, I... I, I, I um, I like the Diaz header at Old Trafford. I thought that was a, a really good finish with Dominic Sobers like right in front of me. I like the way the move was worked and everything, how they got the overload there. That was great. But what one of the ones I really enjoyed was it was it Ipswich, the the the, the kind of the ball in behind to Salah plays him in and then the outside of the foot the boot the outside of the boot pass and Jota just finish it off. Again, just a really good example of kind of the slick football you wanted to see under Arna Slot. And the fact they did that on the opening day of the season, having looked quite slick in pre-season already. I, I just really, really kind of enjoyed that. Um, and, and and again, I just felt like it was kind of a sign of things to come. There obviously have been some other spectacular goals so far this season, but I, but I, for me, that was that was one that I really, really enjoyed because I think it showed this is the, you know, serious football team and this is what they're kind of looking to do this season. Yeah. So we've, got it. we've seen a few what we call slot team goals as well, haven't we? There's been... There's been the odd Nunes blockbuster and things like that, but there has been some impressive team strikes as well this season, no doubt. This one will be tough. Player of the season so far, if it finished today. Yeah, I think there's a few contenders here, but I think I've probably got to go for Gravenberg. Just, you know, and again, a lot of this is based on the fact he's been such a nice surprise, but but equally, actually, it's probably not because ultimately he has just been that good in every game. He really has. He's not just been a standout on the basis of that you didn't see it coming. He's been a standout full stop. I mean, just doing everything that you want from someone who's in that holding to, breaking up the play brilliantly, nicking the ball, um, then you know dribbling forward. He hasn't lost any of that. The quality that he shows in possession, firing ball through the lines. Um, he's just been really, really important for Liverpool, giving them kind of that basis to work from, that foundation, that protection in front of the back four, but then also getting them playing so um yeah for me he's been number one but there's been there's been so many that have been so good i mean you know honorable mentions to to alexander arnold to um, to, to McAllister, to van dyke of course canate alongside has been phenomenal yeah. um you know there's been luis diaz has been playing out of the skin so yeah there's been a, an awful awful lot of um you know really really good individual performances so far this season and that speaks to the fact that the team as a whole is is playing really really well yeah, no doubt. There's so many we could call out. And I suppose it's a it's a two part. So I'll give you this first part. Where do you think, and there's probably quite a few candidates for this as well. Where do you think, based on what you've seen, we have the best cover right now? As in if your first player isn't in, the second one there's the smallest, you know, worry, shall we say? I think I think at the moment it's probably that left wing, isn't it, with, with Diaz and, and Gakpo, just the way that both of them have played this season, both been outstanding. And you just had, you know, if Luis Diaz comes back from the international break and he's got a slight worry, you, you just aren't concerned whatsoever that Gakpo is starting at Chelsea. It's basically like for like in terms of the quality level of the performances so far. And um, so, yeah, I, I think that is the one at the moment. But I mean, 
again, you know, you shouldn't forget that across the pitch, there's, there's quite a few there. I'm thinking, you know, Bradley coming in for Trent, you will be, he's not the same player, but you'd be absolutely happy with that. Um, you know, you, you're thinking Chiesa, who we've not seen much of yet, but coming in for Salah, that's really exciting. Uh, I think Simicast has done a really good job. Quance is still sitting on the bench. So, you know, this is a really strong Liverpool squad. And again, you know, because they've had horrendous injuries in the past, we really shouldn't forget that fact that the the, the backups in, in a lot of positions are really good. You know, Harvey Elliott in for, for Sobers lie again, looking yeah. forward to seeing that after the break. So, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really, really strong squad. There they are, no doubts about it. I suppose the flip side to that, where would you be concerned? I suppose maybe if it's an injury or out for a while, there is the biggest drop-off in this squad. Like I said, they, they could probably do with another essential midfield, but I, but I think that it's probably unfair to say drop off because the next cab off the rank in that central two there is Curtis Jones, who I think is a fabulous player. I think he's got a big role to play this season, so uh, probably wouldn't pick that for for me at the moment. Maybe it's possibly that that centre forward role, just with when Nunes isn't playing with confidence and he he comes in and you know, I just think there's been too many games this season where he has come in and he just hasn't looked right and and I don't you know I think I think Jota's still got some improvements to make in terms yeah. of he plays that role um, but he is always a, always a threat for a, a goal or a goal contribution of some variety so mm. uh, whereas Nunes I don't think quite has that and I think he's kind of struggling at the moment so for me and it, it's only because the squad is so strong at the moment like I say that that becomes the biggest drop off but you know you hope that if Nunes can get his confidence back and, and start playing well again um, that that you know it wouldn't quite be you wouldn't quite be considered that same drop off. Yeah, fingers crossed uh, around that. I suppose it, the way I see it at the moment is just personally, Van Dijk and Canate are playing on such a level right now, and it's so strange because Quanza and Gomez are superb centre backs on their own right. There's no doubts about it. But you just want one. I wouldn't want to see Van Dijk or Canate out the team for a long period. Just just that to me that a first. Well, Van Dijk's the best in the world. And Canate is currently the second best centre back in the Premier League, so it's just the standard is just that yeah, high. Yeah, that's, that's a good point, actually. Is that it's it's not that they've got bad players behind him. Yeah. It's just so so good. You know, the, I mean, the drop off from that Van Dijk is is always going to be enormous because there is nobody close to him. So yeah, that that is a that is a fair point, actually. Yeah, fitness, Ruben Peters. However, you split the medical department, just keep him in mind. Oh, that is all we ask. And, I suppose people are now looking to see because when you first came in, when we've talked about this with Honest Art, we're like, it's hard to assess because you don't know how big the, the changes are going to be, how the players are going to react, time to pick up the system and all this. 99.9% of the questions he's answered so far, but people are naturally looking to, it's this period of the season, isn't it? How does he do on this period? How do we react? You know, Can the squad cope with it? It's early, but people that actually define success as maybe a trophy, the top four. People would love to talk league, but that is a huge ask. We'd love to, you know, be challenges. What are you seeing so far in terms of where you think success can come for this squad? I just, I, I mean, there's just no reason why they shouldn't be trying to win everything that they're in at the moment. I mean, obviously you will fall short in that. I don't expect them to win a quadruple, but at the end of the day, they look like at the moment they could be in title contention. So, you know, keep going along those lines. The, the the you know they're still in the league cup. The FA Cup's yet to come. Um, in Europe, they've made a really strong start. So again, you know, and I would very much think that they should be in that that sort of top eight and, and going through there quite comfortably. So, and um, there's no reason why they shouldn't be. So, you know, in terms of expectations, it, it's kind of you know we could, we are going to learn a lot between now and the next international break. But for now, why wouldn't you be saying that Liverpool are in the hunt for everything, really. And, and, and they've just got to work on that basis. And maybe we will learn that they're not quite at that level in these coming games. But, you know, maybe we will learn that they, they, they are, but they, they've got to work on that basis because, you, you know, you start the season with nine wins out of 10, then you're probably a pretty decent side and, and the underlying numbers look good. So, you know, let, let's see, really. I, you know, I think they should be, um, you know, confident that they can achieve something big this season. Yeah, it also feels like luck will play a part, won't it? Injuries, how other teams fare, and things like that. So, Rod, no one suspected Rodri, did they? Exactly that. Exactly. I was just about to mention Rodri. I just think that that is a that is a hammer blow to City. You know that that we, we could. You know, even if it takes five points off them, that is a it's a huge difference in these title races. Um, I, I still think Arsenal are best place to sort of capitalise on that. 
But again, you know, they get a couple of wonky results or, you know, they get an injury that's that's bad and Liverpool get a bit more fortune in that regard. Or, you know, one goes in off someone's backside late in the game that Liverpool don't deserve to win at all. And, you know, luck is, is a factor when the, the, the margin's so tight. So maybe sometimes that, that look will go in Liverpool's favour and it won't go in the, the opposition's favour. And that's that's what you kind of hope. But, you know, you, you can't do much more than, than giving yourself the, the kind of underlying basis that Liverpool have so far this season. And, you know, the, the hope is now to carry that into the bigger games and, and show what they're all about. And then they're in the mix. And, you know, the the, the, the city the city injury there to, to Rodri has put the cat amongst the pigeons. And like I say, a little bit of bad luck for Arsenal somewhere would would um, would really put Liverpool in the mix. And, you know, let's not forget, they were in title contention and were top of the league, I think, after 30 games last season. So, you know, to go deep in, in, in the title race, even with this squad, and I know it's a change of manager, but that experience is there. Um, so, you know, hopefully they, they, they can they can be there after 30 games and this time not have the injuries to contend with and, and all that. And the, the confidence is up and the belief is there then. And then maybe they can they can go on and win it with a little bit of fortune. So yeah, they, they should be thinking that, and we'll, we'll we'll find out a lot more in the coming games. But I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, absolutely. You, all you can ask is to be there and see what happens, can't you? So loads of positives in that. And as we do, we always finish with the wider football bit. And you mentioned Manchester City. I mean, you know this has dominated football journalism over the last week or so. City and the the APT case, not the hundred so fifteen charges, but. The Associated Party transactions. I mean, you've seen all the reports. Manchester City are claiming a glorious win. The Premier League are claiming a glorious win. Legal experts are telling us it's maybe somewhere in between. It's very complex and nuanced, this whole thing. I mean, what are you making of everything that's going on right now? Uh, uh, well, I will always repeat that this stuff is absolutely depressing, that we have to go through this and, and that this is happening to football. But, you know, it, it is what it is. I think once you let... Um, you know, states into football, then you, you, you're you going to be in a situation like this where, you know, particularly if they don't really massively respect the rules, which I think they've shown, um, you know, not necessarily by even accusing them of cheating, but I think they've shown by trying to consistently undermine them through legal cases. Now, uh, I thought all the stuff about City, it being a big win for City was, was quickly sort of, it was underlined how that was total nonsense really. And, you know, I, I don't know. I was going to say I don't mind. I don't really want to go into criticizing fellow journalists, but I, I don't actually mind it to be honest. Because I think we should all have, be open and have our own opinions. I thought some of the writing and reporting around that, yeah, genuinely pathetic. I, I mean, honestly, you know, we've all from time to time. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that you know, um, I'm a legendary um, Pulitzer Prize winner or anything like that. We've all taken the odd favorable brief from time to time, but only about things that are meaningless. E.g., you know oh, this transfer is going to be good or, you know, this is why yeah. X or Y wasn't signed and this was a good reason for it, blah, blah, blah. Um, but but doing so around something that could genuinely tear apart the fabric of football, our much-loved sport in England, it just, it. what are you doing? Have some yeah. self-respect and, and some respect for the game itself and what this is doing. And the fact is that it was so easy to just look at the actual report itself and see that this wasn't a win for Manchester City in any description. You know, they, they had minor successes on a couple of very, very small points within APT. Yeah. And in no way has it voided the existence of them. In, if anything, well, actually, what it did was strengthen the case of APT because it said in the judgment that, that uh, financial rules could not exist without this being there, which is absolutely right. So it's no way undermined them. And it's just basically small technicalities around um, you know, allowing clubs access to a database that shows the financial information so that they can benchmark it before they come to the Premier League, which I think is a very, very fair point. I also think including owner loans in there at fair market value, again, is a very, very fair point. The fact is City weren't doing this so that those fair points could be ironed out. They're doing it to undermine the whole thing, to strengthen their yeah. case in the one one five situation. So uh, it, just utterly depressing, really. And, and like I say, the reporting around it, I'd like, I'd like to think some of those journalists would feel shame, to be honest, but they, I'm sure they, they absolutely won't. And, you know, because they'll, they'll keep getting the briefs and they'll keep being able to write up their take, their definitive take on the this judgment uh, five minutes after it comes out and it's 100 and odd yeah. pages long. And, um, you know, I suppose that's the benefit for them is if they're so close into City that they can get that their, their take on it out much quicker, even though, and, and try and set the tone. But yeah, utterly pathetic, really. And I, I, and I just think, yeah, I, I don't, didn't think it was a, my, my, my overall feeling was that it wasn't a win 
for City at all, really, apart from on some minor points that won't actually, you know, some of which won't actually help them at all. Uh, yeah. And I just hope we can get swift conclusions this one one five case and, and and whatever the outcome is that it's a fair one and, uh, and we can just you know put it to bed. But I'm sure what will you know either way what whatever way that sort of case goes, there'll be more legal challenges, there'll be more yeah. cases brought, and and yeah, it's just absolutely depressing. And football should never have been allowed to get in this situation really, but it is what it is, and, and here we are. And you just hope, like I say, swift resolution to all this and. Um, we can get it over with and, and never talk about it again. That would be the dream, but I, I don't think that's probably going to happen that quickly, is it? Is is that the big worry? To be honest, if you look at just the first part, how much you say the media briefings, even the Premier League have talked about a few things. It's not quick just because of the legal fees being invoked, and the other clubs are going to be happy. The only people that are going to be happy on this is the lawyers and the amount they're charging. Isn't it? This is just going to rumble on, unfortunately. Well, I think you've seen that even if City lose this case or whatever and, and lose it convincingly that, you know, ultimately they'll probably do, could be declaring a victory or they'll be undermining it in some way or saying it's not right or launching a legal challenge of some sort. I know they can't go to cast candy, but I'm sure they will pull every lever that's available to them to sort of slow things down and, and block and, and make things difficult. Then there'll be legal challenges from other clubs you've been affected by it, uh, yeah. all that to look forward to. So it's just fantastic, really. Uh, that we, you know, the, the Premier League have allowed it to get to this situation, but like I say, my my take on the the City thing is okay. If you if you didn't cheat, fair enough, and um, go and prove it, and um, you know, and, and and if they can prove that definitively, and we can all read that judgment and say, do you know what? Actually, they've been stitched up a little bit here. This isn't right. I'd be happy to read that. I'd be happy to know that the last few years of Premier League actually were done legitimately and that it wasn't a nonsense yeah. and that you know and then you'd be asking questions then about the premier league and the people who run it and why they felt that this was you know but the fact is we we have all also seen those emails so unless i see definitive proof that they are falsified or something like that then there will always be questions there so um yeah so i so i don't think we're going to get that proof unfortunately i don't yeah. get that outcome so if that's going to be the case it would be nice if city just took their that took their medicine and took the punishment but I don't expect that will be the case either. So yeah, it, it's going to be absolutely awful and negative, no matter which way this plays out. Unfortunately, uh, and again, that 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 falls on the powers that be a Premier League yeah. for for allowing it to get to this point. Really, yeah, it does. But at least the Reds are back in action. They're still top of the league, and there's a lot to look forward to with Chelsea at this coming Sunday, and another small very small break from international football so all it leads me to say is ever david for the time for the insight much appreciated thanks for having me ladies and gents that was other media matters fan field index